Hello. My name is Coleman Watts of the core team. Uh, oh, I'm Tim Martin, also the core team. And we're going to talk to you today about um, CVCRM UI for developers. And when we were organizing this presentation months ago, or, <laughs> or last night, um, Tim said, you know, Coleman, we need a story to be able to tell and not just give this jumble of information. So I thought, well, what's the story? The story is maybe it's the evolution of CVCRM. Nobody's ever done that story before, right? And so I then tried to get some screenshots of older versions of CVCRM so I could show you some of the evolutionary steps. And I asked Karun, and Karun said, oh, you could use my presentation on the evolution of CVCRM that I gave a couple of times. <laughs> um, I'm not stealing his entire presentation. I'm just taking one screenshot out of it. But it's a fascinating thing to look at um, if you ever go in and look at the rest of it. Now, the slides do go, right? Yes. So um, this is CVCRM circa 2005. This is if you're creating a new contact record. Um, so this is, this is what you don't have to deal with today. Um, but I just wanted to talk, you know, CVCRM has been around for a while, and um, the technology for web apps has completely changed in that time. Um, and so uh, CVCRM started in 2005 with, with the best tools that were available at that time, some of the best tools that were available. It was hard to know exactly what was going to come out on top, sort of like today, actually. <laughs> It was hard to know, like, if we use this versus that, which one is ultimately going to prove to be better in the long run? Um, but like any web-based thing at that time, I don't know if the word web app was coined at that time, um, every, uh, it was a round trip to the server to do anything um, and, you know, completely refresh the page if you wanted to display any form, submit the form, clunk, 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 clunk. And, um, like today, the HTML was generated by QuickForm and Smarty. Um, and then, then they started to play with JavaScript um, to be able to uh, enhance this experience so that it wasn't quite so clunky and so that you could add little bits of information, show and hide fields. Um, and for people that have ever tried to write pure JavaScript uh, without the use of any libraries, you'll probably find that the libraries are there for a reason. Um, they help a lot, um, and so, but they were all just sort of starting up at that time. Okay, a little, that's a little bit of the backstory. Um, and so with JSPAN and then Dojo and then moved to jQuery when it became, well, when, around the time that Drupal adopted it, I think, and a around the time that the popularity of that project was really taking off. Um, and so to talk about some of the things that we're doing that have been doing since then and have, has kept on evolving. Um, one of them is uh, jQuery UI. Um, and we use that for um, a number of things and have, have been using it for a while um, to do uh, different UI elements, um, the pop-up dialogues that you see, the icons, buttons, uh, tabs, um, some input widgets um, such as uh, the date picker, um, what they call a spinner, which is just the up and down arrows inside of a number field, if you want to increment or decrement the number inside that field. It's a really simple thing that you would think would be in browsers like Firefox, but it's not. Um, and then, then there's some other things about jQuery UI that are a little bit underwhelming and we haven't been using. Um, like they came out with a menu plugin recently that doesn't really do everything, unfortunately, that we need it for, for the menu bar. And so that's still using the, um, the old library. Um, and then, but in addition to being a framework, in addition to having widgets, it's also a framework for creating widgets. Um, and so we have been doing some of that too, um, to, enhance, um, uh, to enhance the developer experience and to, um, to make our code more reusable. Um, and I'll get into some more of that, um, what we've been doing. So another aspect of the UI that has progressed over the years in CVCRM, 
Oh, I should have put in a screenshot of notifications in previous versions of Civri Serum, but you probably remember the yellow bars with the little triangle inside them. Um, and now we have a number of different options um, for notifying users and hopefully not bugging them to death with these notifications. Um, so CRM alert, which will display a pop-up that looks like that. Um, CRM confirm, which will display uh, something that looks like this um, and <laughs> presents uh, <laughs> what, what button were you trying to click on, Eileen? What? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then there's CRM status, which will, um, I don't know if it's something that you've noticed in recent versions of Civi CRM. I actually didn't add it to this slide. I should have. It would have been very small. Um, just a little, little green, yellow or green notice, yellow, green, or red notice at the top of the screen to let you know that something is okay in progress or not okay um, without having to get in your face and block your view of the screen. Um, and that status is something that I've been um, encouraging people to look at using. Um, it really changed the experiences of using, for example, Civi Volunteer, which was one of the first, um, first times that we were trying to do um, saving stuff immediately rather than saving stuff by hitting a save button. Um, and so uh, Every time you would click anything in Civi Volunteer, it would pop up this big saved, saved, saved um, alert that looks like that up at the top. Um, and so now you can use it. Um, and the API itself supports this. So if you um, put in a call to the Civi Serum API 3, the client side API, um, there's a fourth parameter. This is documented um, that will let you um, pass that call into CRM status, um, which will show up a yellow box saying saving or processing or something like that while the API call is running. And when it's done, it'll automatically change that to a green box that says saved or done or something like that. Um, and then I'll put in another plug about not using these things um, because, um, or particularly not using confirm boxes. Um, because I think that it's something that developers sometimes think that they have to do and haven't really thought about the other UI options to a confirm box. It's like, oh, the user is about to do something stupid. I, as the brilliant developer, will just put in this little confirm box to make sure that they're, they're not stupid. But we're, just, we're training users to ignore those things by putting them in all over the place. Um, you know, every time, you know, uh, well, I don't know. If, I'm sure you guys used computers in the 80s and 90s, too. Like, every time you want to eject a disk, are you sure? Um, you know, there's the overuse of confirm boxes um, will eventually just become noise. Um, and so um, a lot of uh, newer uh, UI elements in Civi, um, when you close a dialog box that has unsaved changes in a form, or you navigate away from a tab that has unsaved changes, it'll just let you. Um, but it'll also pop up a little notification saying, you know, by the way, your changes were unsaved. You can click here to go back to them and restore them if you want to or just keep on going, you know, ignore this if you want to. So that's a nice alternative, um, undo as a alternative to, as opposed to alerts. Another, um, another evolutionary thing that's been added incrementally into Civi CRM, um, once, um, once we had this Ajax API that could make direct changes to the Civi CRM database from the client side, just fire off an API request while the user is in the middle of doing other things, um, it made sense to use that for in-place editing. And so if you structure the markup of your page um, or table in such a way that you have put in these semantic classes, um, like this screen here, this would all be surrounded in a div um, that, has, that says what entity type it is, which is the participant status entity, um, so, that, so that then it knows what API to use. Um, and all of these would be surrounded in a div that say what field they are. Um, and all of these rows would have an ID so that it knows what entity you're trying to save. Then it can do it. Um, and uh, 
I don't know if you've played with this in 4.6 at all, but this is a new feature um, in 4.6 that it can, if that field happens to have an option list, it will just look it up for you um, and fetch the options and populate the select. Um, and we also added those nice buttons in 4.6 to make the in-place editing experience a little bit better. Um, and this in-place editing is something that you can do. Um, it's very, it has a very specific way that it works in that you edit one field that's in one entity and you save that one entity, one field, uh, and then you can save, uh, edit something else, as opposed to um, what you see on the contact summary screen, which is big blocks of forms that you're editing all at the same time. And that's a very different idea. Something else that's been evolutionarily progressing is trying to improve some of the default behavior of HTML, um, which is something that all web apps have had to deal with because multi-selects suck. Um, and you've got to do something about that or, or just accept that they suck. Um, and so uh, like Drupal and WordPress and, um, uh, and these content management systems that we live in, um, we've dealt with those problems in different ways. And one of the early ways, um, earlier ways, um, was getting this plugin, which I think was called ASM Select or something like that, that would take a multi-select and make it look like a single select, and then when you selected options, they would come down here. If you were to select like 25 options, all of a sudden your screen would get really crazy looking. Um, so uh, when we, uh, so this was one plugin that got to bite the dust when we added select two in 4.5. So those screens now look like this. Um, uh, another approach to the multi-select problem was to use checkboxes instead, and so some civi forms will just have this scrolling div full of checkboxes, which is nicer than a multi-select, um, although it's, it still takes up a lot of room um, compared to, again, select two, which can be nice and compact. So that was another one. And then finally, um, this crazy thing that comes with quick form, which was, is ironically called advanced multi-select, um, which is now deprecated advanced multi-select, um, <laughs> which takes one, which takes one multi-select field, and if that wasn't bad enough, makes it into two. Um, uh, also now, this is, this is from the uh, mailing screen, so when you're composing a new mailing, you can include groups or exclude groups. Um, that's now being represented very nicely. Um, with a select two that compacts those two plus two other um, select boxes. Um, so that's one UI enhancement that um, you pretty much get for free if you're developing it for 4.5 or 4.6. Um, these things are initialized just based on their CSS class. Uh, you don't have to write any code that does anything special. Um, and another thing that we added uh, with um, using select two was these entity ref fields. Um, again, based on the, AP, the fact that most entities in CiviCRM have an API, the API can be accessed via AJAX, and so uh, uh, the, the most obvious example is a contact reference field, um, which allows for the contact object to be searched um, and filtered uh, in 4.6, there are filters available now in the entity ref field. If you click on this, you'll get um, filtered by contact type or group or tag, um, a few other things. Um, and uh, so there was the, so this actually, this was nice. This got us, this allowed us to get rid of two other jQuery libraries. So I think we're up to the body count of four or five jQuery libraries that we've killed off with this one. Um, uh, one was the jQuery autocomplete, which was being used for single contact reference fields, and the other one was token input, which was being used for multi um, contact reference fields. Uh, and this can do both pretty handily. Um, and so I encourage you to take a look at the entity ref documentation if you haven't played with it. Um, you can create an entity ref field in one line from, in, with one line of code, 
uh, from either PHP or JavaScript, um, and there's also an Angular binding, which Tim will get into. Um, and finally, sort of completing the evolution of our, um, uh, maybe sort of the, the final evolution of our server-side rendering stuff, uh, enhancements, is to take these round-trip pages that are composed by the server, going through, the sp going through Smarty templates to be rendered, um, and output as a blob of HTML to the browser. Um, instead of doing that using a full page refresh, um, we can just fetch it uh, with Ajax. And so uh, Civi CRM, if you haven't played with this, if you ever are browsing Civi CRM and you just add um, in the URL bar, if you just add another argument and snip it equals one, then and hit enter, then you'll be then instead of getting the full CMS rendered content with the menus and sidebars and footer, etc., you'll just get the snippet from that Civi CRM page um, or form. And so we take advantage of this in 4.5 um, by adding a bunch of um, JavaScript APIs to allow this to be really easy. It's so easy, in fact, that if you are writing an extension or want to customize a, a page of Civi CRM and you want to fetch some page from somewhere, let's say that you've, let's say that your extension has written a little form. And so you've used civics, civics generate form, the form has a few fields, um, it's going through a template, and you can access that form at some URL. Um, you know, Civi Serum slash my form. And so you can, you can access it, and it'll be a full page form when you do that. You could, and then you add a link to that form somewhere. Um, say on the contact summary page, um, you add a little link that says, you know, access the custom form. If you just add the CSS class to that link, CRM pop-up, then instead of taking the user to that page, it'll just pop up the form. And when they click save, it'll just refresh the content underlying, assuming that they've changed something. If they hit cancel, it won't. It'll just disappear. Um, and so here's an example um, on, from the contact summary page. Creating a new activity pops up one snippet. And then you say, oh, I, by the way, I want to create a new contact um, for the person who's doing this activity. Pop up another snippet. Save the first one, refreshes the second one. Save the second one, refreshes the underlying content. So all of that happens automatically now. All you have to do is have one CSS class. It's kind of nice. Um, uh, and in addition, if there's more extra fancy stuff that you want to do, like um, that form, uh, when it submits, um, it needs to send something to the client, um, send something to the web browser so that it can do something else on the screen, um, there's a nice um, PHP uh, variable that you can add to the form that'll just do that, and it'll automatically just come through. Um, I'm not showing any code examples for this because this is all quite documented. Um, and so I really encourage you to go and read the manual um, for there are, um, there are uh, manual pages, um, reference pages, reference sheets for all of this stuff. Um, so there's reference sheets for notifications. There's reference sheets for the AP, AJAX API. Reference sheets for select two, entity ref, other UI elements. Um, there's a whole reference sheet on various UI elements. Some of them I haven't even covered. Um, and um, also for snippets and how to use, um, how to do anything with pop-ups, how to do anything with loading content um, via AJAX. Um, and if you find that anything is missing, please help write the manual as well. <laughs> please. Um, it's a wiki. Anybody can edit it. Um, if you add a cool new feature um, or you discover a feature that um, just doesn't happen to be in there, please add a note about it. So that's, that's sort of the first, that's a, sort of an overview of the evolution within the framework of still using QuickForm and Smarty um, to um, to generate pages. And now I'm going to turn it over to Tim for what might be the next steps beyond that.
it's kind of nice to be here today. Uh, I like to get out of the house. You know, once or twice a year I come to a CiviCon and there are other people and there's some sunlight coming through the windows. It's kind of cool. Um, I actually had an interesting experience when I first joined the core team. Uh, I, I was an integrator and then, you know, I sold my shop and joined the core team. And when I I started work, I came to CiviCon. Like, that was my first day on the job, was being at CiviCon. And immediately, we started talking about Symphony and how Symphony was going to revolutionize uh, the Civi CRM interfaces. Uh, let's see. And I feel like each time I come, we have a conversation sort of like that. And each year, it's a slightly different technology or fashion that we want to talk about. So sometimes it's Symfony or it's the Drupal Form API or Drupal Entities or Backbone or B Angular or Ember or this year it should be, but maybe we'll have to wait till next year because no one's doing it yet, React.js. Right? There's, it's just a little mind boggling, right? <clears throat> now, there are several things that we usually talk about when we uh, look for a holy grail and several reasons we come up with, right? We love this idea that it'll be an external library maintained by smart people who write detailed documentation. It's written in a popular language, you know, PHP or JavaScript that anybody can learn and has a large pool of developers. It's carefully optimized and it looks pretty. <laughs> so, you know, every holy grail, it, it uh, it offers a lot of promises, and reality tends to be a bit different, especially when you get into a substantial project. So rather than jump off the deep end on any one of these, we've done a series of sort of substantive experiments, right? And some of the experiments wind up merged in the core code base, and some of them don't. Uh, but I want to talk a little bit about one of my favorite experiments that has been merged into the uh, code base as part of the 4.6 cycle for CiviMail. Uh, and it, it's one of my favorite experiments because I think it addresses something that Civi's UI code generally hasn't addressed well, which is structure. And it's a terribly broad term, so let me clarify what I mean, right? I'm not talking about the choice of libraries or the build process or the split between the business logic and the presentation layer or the integration between the CMS and the CRM, right? I'm talking about the UI structure, about UI decomposition. When you take a look at an image, right, like that picture of Harrison Ford and uh, his holy grail, your, your eye immediately breaks it down into a number of different objects at different levels, right? You see a cup, you see a man, a body, a head, a face. On the face, you see two eyes, each eye individually, a nose, a mouth. You see all these things at the same time. And the same applies to a computer screen, right? When you look at it, there are a number of lines that form boxes and segments. And it, it's very natural to break down a screen um, along those lines. But when you look through Civi's code, there isn't a, a clear convention for making lines, right? For breaking down sections of a page into smaller sections that can be uh, chunked and reused and swapped out. All right. So structure, what do I mean? For, all right, so for 4.6, this experiment was with the Civi Mail UI. We wanted to revamp the user interface, which has gotten a bit dated and a bit clunky. Um, specking the design process was controversial. Um, I, you know, I, I'd make a, a mock-up and it would have a wizard and I'd send it out to some people and one person would say, hey, I love wizards. They make things simple for the user. It's one step at a time. And someone else would say, oh my god, I hate wizards. They're so tedious. They drag things out. Right? And it, it's really hard to, to get a consensus on some of those things. I do feel that uh, opinions generally fell into two camps. Uh, there was sort of a wizard camp and a unified camp, right? The, the wizard camp w believes that the process should be a lengthy process and a thoughtful process in composing a new mail blast. And the unified camp thinks that it should be a simple process, like Gmail with a couple extra features or, or widgets to make it better. Um, and how do you solve that conflict, right? It's really a basic conflict about the design of the interface. And the best I can come up with is ship both layouts or let people customize the layout, right? Customizing 
the layout in the old code base was basically unimaginable. Right? I've tried it back in 2.0. And it, m moving one field from one step of a wizard to the next step of a wizard requires removing it from the PHP class, removing it from the Smarty template, adding it to another PHP class, adding it to another Smarty template, and often doing some gymnastics to make sure you understand which data is being loaded on each page at a given point. Right? Very hard. Uh, Now, this is not to say that Civi doesn't try or hasn't tried to break things into smaller pieces that are reusable. We do from time to time. Uh, the problem is that we don't have a consistent style or format for doing so. Right? We don't have a, a consistent model. And for that, I think there's a piece that we're really missing from our architecture of a block, right? a chunk of content that you can pick up and move around. Uh, in decomposing the CiviMail UI, there are a number of blocks you can see on that screen just by scanning and looking at the lines. There's a preview block, a schedule block, an HTML editing block. If you switched over to one of those other tabs, you would see under attachments, there's an attachments block with a list of all the attachments and an add new button. Right? If you go quickly between these two uh, different CiviMail screens, you'll actually see that the same content winds up getting placed on both of them, but the blocking is different, or the placement of the blocks is different. So here we have a big container with a wizard, and the wizard is broken down into three steps. And then in the first step, we have several accordions, and we use our block, we put our blocks inside of accordions. Over here, we don't have a wizard, but we do have several tabs, and we put each of our blocks inside of a tab. All right, duh. I mean, isn't this obvious? Like, y you use Drupal, don't you? Or you use WordPress or you use Joomla. They've got blocks or they've got modules. They've got uh, short codes. Isn't it kind of obvious that you should have a way to break out a chunk of uh, content and reuse it well? <laughs> Evidently not. Um, there are, are reasons why I think uh, we wound up without a strong convention for a block. And part of it is that the original code sets the tone. And I think the original code was built out quickly with uh, an emphasis on features and not much of an emphasis on uh, decomposing parts that can be reused. Um, it's also an issue because uh, it's also something we've had to face because the stack has evolved so much in that time. Right? What you could do with Web 1.0 and HTML and PHP in 2005 is very different than what you do nowadays with AngularJS or Ember or any of those. Uh, and lastly, you know, when we get patches, uh, there, it's often someone who's learning how to work with the code base at the same time that they're writing the patch. And uh, it, it's a struggle to get just a minimal patch. And often the minimal patch is not the cleanest patch that preserves an architecture. So. You know, it, it's, it's tough, and there are reasons why we're here. But I don't want to spend my time complaining. There's basically one theme that I want to push, right, which is this idea of blocks and specifically driving toward a top-level document, right, where any screen that you prepare should have a summary of the major UI elements and their, the arrangement among them, right? And the great thing about a document like this is that we can take that document and replace it with another document that remixes the same parts in a different order. And in CiviMail, that's exactly what we've done. There are actually four different variations on the CiviMail user interface that are basically rearranging those tags in different orders. Uh, and they're all shipped with 4.6. Yes. And you, you can use them all. <coughs> what you can do right now is go into the address bar when you're composing a mailing, you do slash and then wizard, or slash unified, and it will switch between them. Yep. Uh, in developing this project, OK, so this project is based off of Angular, right? And the neat thing is that Angular has its own concept for defining a block, 
right? They call it a directive. It's basically a quasi HTML element, which has been defined using a mix of JavaScript and more HTML. Um, we've created several uh, HTML elements that match the styling and use a lot of the same underlying uh, UI elements as the core code base, but they're implemented in Angular, so you get the same flexibility. And I just want to give a shout out to some of them, you know, for wizards with steps, for tabs with individual tabs, accordion state picker, etc. Uh, CM CRM entity ref, that's a pretty cool one that Coleman brought up earlier. Um, and to get more about them, it's a little bit tricky right now. We don't have a whole lot of documentation on the AngularJS city stuff. So your best bet is to learn AngularJS. Right? Go with one of their tutorials. And then you can take a look at an example of some Civi code that's using AngularJS. I have created a code generator. So if you know civics and you know how to create an extension, you can generate a boilerplate page, which is an Angular-based page, and add some directives to it. And that, I believe, is all I have.